Does anyone here remember the musical Stop the World, I Want to Get Off? My parents had that album when I was growing up. It wasn't the music or the story that interested me, age nine or ten, but that title. It spoke to me of something I knew but could never have put into words. When I thought of it, I pictured our planet spinning in space and all the people running at full tilt on top, trying to keep up. It would be nice, wouldn't it, to be able to stop the world for a while and get off? And the thing is, I knew how to do it. It was easy. I did it all the time. All it took was my beanbag, an unscheduled morning, and losing myself in a novel. Within seconds, I was gone. If the world carried on spinning without me, I did not notice. I was somewhere else, completely. I'm older now. I'm married with a ten-year-old of my own. I work. And it's very rare now that I get to stop the world and get off. I have no shortage of books or places to read them, but I don't have unscheduled mornings. I don't have unscheduled half hours. From the minute my feet touch the carpet in the morning, it's like a gun's gone off. I'm already in a panic as I get my son up and give him breakfast and take him to school. My days are a matter of how fast and efficiently I can cross things off the to-do list while being interrupted every 30 seconds by the beep of an email or the ping of a text, the demands of running a house, a life. It's 11 o'clock when I'm in bed that I finally get to pick up a book. That's when I read, except that I don't, because two sentences in, I'm asleep. Trying to read a novel at the rate of two sentences a night does not transport me anywhere. <laughs> what it does is ensure I lose interest and give up halfway through. On my bedside table, I have a stack of books which have failed to transport me anywhere, which I've given up halfway through. And then, this novel came along. Milkman by Anna Burns. So I wanted to give up this one from about halfway down page one. It was the narrative voice. It's set in Northern Ireland at the time of the Troubles, and our narrator, who goes unnamed, is an 18-year-old girl. All she's ever known is conflict. One of her brothers is dead, another has disappeared, and now she's being stalked by the milkman, a notorious terrorist, a dangerous, powerful man. She has nowhere to run, no one to turn to, and the voice goes round and round in circles. It repeats itself. Sometimes it doesn't make sense. I felt hectored by this voice. It was uncomfortable. It was the last place I wanted to be at 11 o'clock at night. So I gave it up, like the others. But there was a problem with all this giving up. In fact, there were several problems. I'm a novelist myself. I teach creative writing. Novels are what my life is about. I'm also a bibliotherapist, so I prescribe novels for other people. And with my friend Ella, I've written a book, The Novel Cure, in which you look up your ailment, and we suggest a novel to cure it. So, let's try it here. Itchy feet? Try the Odyssey. Low self-esteem, a dose of Maurier. On the back there, hate your nose. Patrick Suskin's perfume will sort you out. And a bit of a daddy's girl, don't worry, I'm one too. Jane Austen's Emma would be good for us. I'm the person who encourages other people to read. I can't be the one who gives up. And besides, Milkman won the Booker Prize in 2018. The judges decided that not only was this novel worth reading, it was the novel the most worth reading of all the novels to be published in, that, in English in that year. The problem wasn't the novels, the problem was me. I, the novelist, the creative writing tutor, the bibliotherapist, had become a lousy reader, too busy to read, too distracted to focus. 
and failing to finish the book she started. So I picked that novel off the pile and plunged back in. And that's when I discovered that this girl, this 18-year-old girl living in Northern Ireland in the 70s, has a habit she calls reading while walking. She walks the streets of her city with an open novel in front of her face. And it's always a 19th century novel, because she lives in the 20th century already, and she does not like it. So she reads things like Ivanhoe and Martin Chuzzlewit. And there's a description of what happens when she takes the novel out of her bag and sinks into it. And the rhythm of this passage is the rhythm of her walking and the rhythm of her breathing. And it's lulling. It's deeply lulling. And for a brief moment, calm descends. Of course, she's reading to escape, to take refuge from the violence that surrounds her every day. Reading changes the rhythm of her mind. It turns her attention inward. And in this inward place, she gets to live a bit. In Martin Chuzzlewit, she gets to meet Sam Pecksniff, a far more entertaining villain than the ones on the streets of her city. And in Ivanhoe, she watches a medieval jousting tournament where a masked, masked knight swoops in and wins all the fights. Who wouldn't rather be there? She's 18. She wants adventure. She's hungry for life. But what she's doing is radical. She's putting two fingers up to the violence. Instead, she's going 20,000 leagues under the sea, in the Nautilus, with the mysterious Captain Nemo. Or she's lying on a battlefield, wounded, in Russia, with Prince Andre, looking up and seeing not the fighting, but the vastness and serenity of the sky. Or she's with Jane, standing at the altar next to the sexiest man in literature, hearing that he has a wife already, and that she must find it in herself to walk away, even though it's the last thing in the world she wants to do. In these novels, she discovers that it makes no difference what country we live in, what race we are, what set of political or religious beliefs we ascribe to. We all have the same need to connect to other people. We all feel pain if those connections break down. We're all capable of lashing out in anger. We all find it hard to forgive. And she learns, too, that stories have endings, that things can change, that wives in the attic can conveniently die, and Jane can go off and make her fortune and come back as Rochester's equal. And when she returns the novel to her pocket again, her bag, and looks up at the streets of her city again, she sees them with changed eyes. But her family think her habit of reading while walking is dangerous. They want her to give it up. They want her to engage with the conflict like them. And eventually, her best friend takes her out for a drink and says, it's not only dangerous, it's deviant, it's disturbing. It's perverse. And our narrator says, well, hang on a minute, you're saying it's okay for the milkman to go around with Semtex, but it's not okay for me to read Jane Eyre in public? And the friend says, well, yes, Semtex fits in around here. It displays an awareness of what's going on. Your habit of reading while walking does not. And she goes on and on at, at the narrator. She hectors her, like the narrator had been hectoring me, until the narrator can't stand it anymore, and she goes, OK, OK, I'll stop, I'll give it up. And she does. She gives up books. She gives up the only place where she feels safe, where she can exist in the calm and the privacy of her own mind, and just be. And I feel frightened for her. Books were her defense. It may have been dangerous for her to do it, but it's even more dangerous for her not to. Without books, she's vulnerable. And the next time the milkman pulls up his van and offers her a lift, she doesn't have a book with her. 
And when he leans over and opens the passenger window, she makes a decision. And she does the very worst thing she could possibly do. Well, I was so hooked by this time, I could not put Milkman down. I read it on the loo, I stayed up till 3 a.m., I read it while waiting for the kettle to boil, whilst waiting for my son to come out of school. But by the time I had finished, I knew I'd found my cure. Milkman showed me that reading was as critical for me in my life as it was for that 18-year-old girl, that I had to make time for it. And compared to the girl in Milkman, I have it really easy I don't live in a war zone. I live in a village outside Sherborne. I'm not being stalked, as far as I know. <laughs> but I have other battles. I'm at the mercy of my to-do list, my mobile phone, the constant bombardment of texts, emails, tweets, the Instagram feed, the Facebook notifications, all these things which seek to drain me of my two most precious resources, my attention and my time. And in the face of this bombardment, I too go round and round in circles. My mind too feels scattered and frayed. I too feel vulnerable to manipulation and suggestion. The quick fix of the Amazon purchase, the half hour wasted surfing on YouTube. My family too doesn't particularly want me to read. My son would rather I play Lego with him. My husband would rather I watch Netflix. My mother would rather I have a cup of tea with her. And, I, and it's hard. I have to say to these people I love, no, I'm reading. And to all the people behind the texts and the emails and the Instagram photos, I'm saying, no, you'll have to wait. I'm reading. When I was younger, there was nothing radical about reading. It was expected of me, encouraged. I had time. But now, reading a novel, any novel, but particularly a challenging novel, like Milkman, is a radical act. It's radical because it demands my undivided attention with no interruptions. It's radical because it turns me inward, away from the world. It's radical because it requires effort, even patience. And it's radical because there's no immediate gratification. I have no idea when I start a new novel if it'll be worth the time and the effort I'm about to invest. Every time I start a new novel, it's a risk. Deciding to take that risk with Miltman was one of the best things I ever did. It gave me back what I'd lost. It strengthened my ability to focus. It gave me a space in which to repair my scattered mind. And in that space, I encountered myself. And by the time I emerged, I was more whole, less vulnerable, more able to engage with and understand my family, the people in my community, the people beyond that, more able to forgive and more able to give more able, in fact, to live. I would not have finished Milkman if I hadn't made some changes to how and where and when I read. If, like me, reading at the end of the day isn't working for you, find a new time to read. You might have to think laterally. I persuaded my son to take the bus to school, and in the 45 minutes that I would have spent driving, I took to the sofa with a novel in the afternoons. We also lowered our carbon footprint a little bit, and my son got to discover Heart FM instead of boring old Radio 4. <laughs> Create a reading nook, a special place just for reading. This might be the sofa, or it might be a hammock, or one of those lovely hanging chairs. This not only adds an extra sensual element to the experience, but it also signals to other people that you're busy. You might look like you're there, but you're not there. You've just met Mr. Tumnus and been invited back to his house for tea.
defend your nook. Turn that phone on silent, put it in another room. When you start a new book, give it time to get under your skin. Nobody would expect to enjoy a film that they watched in five-minute episodes a night. 45 minutes should be enough. Once you're hooked, then the book will take care of the rest. Equip yourself with some reading accessories so that you can multitask. This is my favorite. This wonderful reading stand allows me to read while eating. A head torch or one of those clip-on reading lamps allows you to read while other people are sleeping. And audiobooks, of course, a much safer way to read while walking or running or working out at the gym. My friend Juliet told me once that sometimes when her family, her husband and sons and her are all out together in the garden at the weekends, she calls out to them, I'm just going inside to see about supper. And she goes all the way through the house and out the other side, and she finds a corner of the front garden where she can read. <laughs> We all have the power to stop the world and get off. All it takes is a novel. For me, reading used to be easy. Now it's a radical act. Join me. Be a radical reader. Carry a novel with you at all times. Read it for pleasure, yes, for distraction, for the sheer delight of a really good story, but also to preserve the stronghold of your mind, your ability to empathize with others and to connect with yourself. Read it to escape in order to be fully present, to say, no, I'm reading, so that you can say, yes, I hear you, and yes, I understand. Thank you.